um, because the only certainty is uncertainty. The things are going to constantly shift and change and being agile and resilient has been the most helpful. So you will get knocked down and a lot of people in my space really believe in failure and encourage failure um, because it's the only way to really understand how you wanna course correct and grow. You're listening to Creative Leadership with Heart, a podcast that inspires people to take action and be the leader they were born to be. I'm Coach Rico, and I'm known for coaching and training executives, leaders, founders, and high performers at Fortune 100 businesses, startups, and more. I'm a 20-year creative executive, leadership and life coach, author, speaker, and serial entrepreneur. I'm here to answer your questions about leadership and personal development while also asking you questions that can unlock your untapped potential. Welcome back, everyone, to Creative Leadership with Heart. Today, I have a really good friend of mine, Barry Adelberg. She is an immersive producer and professor in new media. She is the founder of Split Ends Media, an adjunct professor at NYU. She's also a teaching artist at Dream Yard Project and a program designer at Columbia. So, Barry, thanks for taking the time to be on. Thanks for having me, Rico. Yeah, absolutely. Been looking forward to this for a long time. So, um, First, just a general intro. Tell us a little about a little bit about yourself um, and your journey as a creative in tech and education. Yeah, so um, I grew up in the D.C. area, the D.M.V. for those from the area on the Virginia side. Um, really liberal, artistic parents, both educators. Um, so my sister and I were raised in like kind of a creative household. We were really encouraged to lean into. Um, both like fine arts, but really more specifically crafts, like taking ideas. We made board games as kids. We also did a lot of like fashion design. My sister ended up going to art school and got into fashion. So yeah, we always had like different scraps. My mom used to make clothes. So things were kind of just um, imaginative. We did a lot of like play spaces. And so um, I wasn't surprised when I like went on to pursue my graduate work and decided that I wanted to do this like intersection of art and tech uh, and education that my dad had done a similar study for his doctoral work, kind of thinking about um, how kids think about magic and their capacity, you know, to not only um, map on their stories to larger issues in their lives. So he looked at like kids and superhero complex. Um, mm. But then I kind of decided with my graduate research, I was looking at how kids learn alongside new technologies. So how does technology play a role um, in development, but also in our capacity to expand our creativity, but also uh, share it in really new and interesting ways as the internet has expanded all of our capacity to share. So that's kind of how I got started. Um, yeah. yeah, so I've been between research and production for a decade now. Yeah, it, um, it's interesting. So when I first met you, you were on the research side. Yeah. So I think this would be good to, to get into a little bit. Um, yeah, you were into kids, re like exactly what you said, kids research. And the creative side for you hadn't really, at least in terms of a career, hadn't really come out yet. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about your transition or evolution or however you want to describe it. Um, because yeah, you went from kids education research to now you're, you're working technology or creativity in new media. Yeah, so um, when I was in grad school in the D.C. area, I went to Georgetown and I was part of the Children's Digital Media Center uh, run by Sandy Calvert. And so she was really involved in um, children's media policy and um, PBS and Sesame Workshop uh, consulting. And I found that that world was really exciting for me and I thought I wanted to do TV. So I um, interned at PBS Kids and I ended up in a game role. I ended up getting really excited about interactive. Some of the stuff I was working on um, was in the app space, but then also they were developing an augmented reality app, which was very, very new um, in 2012. So it was really exciting to kind of see how a combination of you know story worlds, how are you mapping stories into the technology, um, but these beloved story worlds. And so it really kind of, sparked my creativity and I knew that there was a production side within this ecosystem, but they also work with a lot of independent producers. And it started to become clear to me like that was the role 
that I needed to be doing, like the development of content, but specifically development of content with kids. So mm. that led me to um, doing more youth programs. I actually, after that, ended up in Philly. Um, I was working with um, University of Pennsylvania, both the departments of education and applied engineering. And we did youth programs all over the city with the free libraries. And so we were um, doing early circuitry, um, all sorts of cool um, experimental installations with the Makey Makey, a lot of MIT Media Lab tech. Uh, we had a partnership with MIT Media Lab because I was funded by a grant that funded Scratch. So that's kind of my connection point. I was doing a lot of um, visual coding language, thinking about um, what are the games that kids are making, and then how do you connect those stories to one another? And um, it was also at the time where, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Scratch, but um, it was it's this computational thinking language that's funded by Lego Foundation. So it's like mm -hmm. little blocks on the screen that piece together. Um, and you can do all sorts of things. You can make a lot of different games. And so I got excited about the idea of game challenges and that led me uh, ultimately to New York. And so I landed in New York, been here ever since. And um, I started working on the National STEM Video Game Challenge. And so that was kind of, you know, a projection, a production transition, really intentionally wanted to do more game making with kids on the design side. Um, and I w worked really closely with that studio as well. So really kind of seeing that side. Um, and then ultimately, which is interesting, it wasn't, it wasn't such a clean transition. It was very nonlinear. Um, the next role that I took was the market research role in the kids space where we met. So it was after I had, you know, I had some experience in production, but was trying to kind of figure out what is this balance of who I am as a creative and a researcher. Got it. Yeah. And you've done so much like since then, right? So you, since we, we, cause we were talking a lot then, and then we hadn't, we lost touch for a little while and you've done a lot since then. So I want to kind of get into that. Cause that was kind of your, your career story. I don't want to even call it transition evolution career story. Um, but you, uh, founded your own agency split ends media. So I'd love to, to dive into that probably first, and then we'll get in, the, if we can, we'll get into like the things you're doing in the education world now, because there's some amazing stuff you're doing there. So what was the drive behind Split Ends Media? And what is it that you guys do? Yes. So I founded Split Ends Media in 2018. Um, initially, it was a response to taking on a large budget. I really felt like I had um, been a freelance artist at that point for a couple of years. And from a business organizational standpoint, and also from a tax standpoint, it made more sense to bring things in house. And so I had also built up the roster at that point that I was confident that I could hire the help that I needed. Um, so I took a big budget in house and had to manage it for the first time. Uh, and that was really how we found it. <laughs> like that was the first project. Um, I worked with that collaborator for a couple of years. We designed um, a pop-up installation that told stories about the interconnectedness of Jewish communities all over the world, and it toured four cities. So that was really oh, wow. how we started, um, which seems kind of tangential to the kids and education aspect, but everything was mixed media. So we had um, this augmented reality um, audio museum walk that we recreated in four different spaces which was really interesting because mm -hmm. it meant like building a modular exhibit and moving the pieces from city to city. So that was really uniquely challenging for me. And the um, set designer that I worked with at the time had just left Sleep No More. And so she was really adept at understanding how to build stories, but specifically visual stories that people touch and feel um, in different spaces. So um, we still work together. Um, she has transitioned into TV and also works in video games. And it inspired, um, really, I, I started to understand how important production design, like traditional mm -hmm. production design is in 3D work in new media um, and wanted to build capacity there. So Split Ends, after we kind of took on this first big project, I started to think like, what is 
this, I asked myself the question you just asked me. I had to like step back and recalibrate, like, what do we do? Who do we want to serve? And the answer became really clear that um, we're new, new media specifically and that we're building capacity in new media. I really like to bring artists from other disciplines into new mediums. So for example, our latest project, we're working on an augmented reality volumetric um, project with the team at Scatter um, and also Relative Arts, which is an all indigenous shop um, and atelier in New York City. And um, we're doing a fashion show for February Fashion Week. Oh, wow. That's so cool. Um, yeah. And, and we talked about it a little bit in the pre-show about community. So I, I'd love for you to share your thoughts on like, it's not a network, it's a community um, yeah. about like what you're building and using split ends as a facilitation for that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's it's really an important distinction for me because I think that your whole career, you're told to like build your network, tap into your network. But like when you really need solid advice or a reflection of self or feedback that you can turn into some type of action that'll serve you, you're going to go to people that you can trust. Um, and to, that trust isn't, you know, just established, it's built over time, right? So mm -hmm. you find that like the people that you want to work with tend to be a lot of the same people because you've built trust over time, but often you've also built like a rhythm. So when I produce something, I know exactly who is available to AP at any given moment. I also teach. So I have a lot of new talent that I'm working with all the time, which is really great while building a company. You know, you just get to um, identify new needs because people, especially the undergrads coming up and I work with high schoolers too, like they're talents that I could even think of developing. Like it's really exciting to see where these things are going and the ideas they have. So um, I do want split ends to facilitate that growth as well, but um, but also really just the power of referral, right? Like you're building a community because you know that if a friend needs somebody in a role that you can with confidence say this person will do that job. Um, they've also done the hard work to define exactly what they do and grow their skill. So it's it's really just additive to be surrounded by those people. And I feel like that is community when you're yeah. giving back and when you're asking what people need to grow. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask, you kind of answered the questions, how you find new talent, but I think something that would be helpful for folks listening is going out and starting your own business like that is fulfilling, but also has its challenges. So what would you say was the biggest challenge, but then also like the most fulfilling piece of starting split ends. And then then definitely I want to jump into the education pieces. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, it's never not challenging, right? But hopefully as you grow, there are new challenges you encounter. So one of the things that was happening is I was encountering the same challenge, which meant that something in my business wasn't working. And I needed to um I needed to hire a director of operations or somebody to help me like understand how to bring in new business. And when reaching that point, it was like a question of, sure, I have maybe, you know, I, I'm not doubting my intelligence to grow in this area, but also you can't do everything. Like you really do need to trust that other people can support you in the ways that um, leave you to focus on the create. You know, I started this and not, not just to be creative, but like I do know when I'm serving in a role that is... Um, you know, bringing together the team in, in ways that others on the team can't, right? And and mm -hmm. hopefully you also hire people that have that same quality um, where, you know, when you work with somebody long enough, you kind of, you know, um, and I think I said before, like a rhythm of you're not really asking for things. You're just kind of, you're working together. And one of the really fulfilling things over time is like, it doesn't feel like it right away, but it's cumulative. Like it's not linear, but it is cumulative that like the work adds up and those machines start working on their own. Like I, I had something this week where it was like, oh, wow, I thought that was going to be a heavy lift, but like you've done this so many times, it was barely a lift at all. So, you know, mm -hmm. you're growing the, the muscle. You're also kind of growing um, this like interconnected team. And, and I've, 
worked, you know, we've only been in business for five years. So um, I've only had one part time, you know, full time employee, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, full time employee for a short period of time. I usually hire project based. But my goal is to grow capacity so that we can have a team that takes on more um, at any given time, because I, I know that we're, we've reached that point. So it is about asking for the help that you need. Um, and then finding those learning communities too. I have a close friend from the kids media space and she has an incredible business. It's called Wonder Why. Uh, her name's Latoy Adams and she's really like a leader in, in the kids research space. Um, but we met while we were in market research in the kids space and um, really the relationship was kind of built on creating our businesses. She's about um, two years ahead of me. And so mm -hmm. always passing down learnings. And we have biweekly meetings um, to check in and to ask questions and to be vulnerable about the things that we don't know. And it it really serves us. We had remet because we both applied to New York City has this um, women and minority owned business uh, program. And so we were both doing the application together and served as accountability partners initially, and then realized like this is working, serving both of us. And so I highly recommend having trusted friends, whether you work with them or not, just to help you along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Like, there's an important thing you said, you know, like building your business, like nobody does it alone. Mm -hmm. And if you believe you can, or you're trying to, you're probably in denial, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> um, because, you know, like you can be really good at a few things, but you can't be really, really good at everything. No. Right. It's just impossible. So, you know, there's a few books that cover this. And the one I'm reading now is the E-Myth, right? Um, that like you just can't do everything on your own and you you do need to hire out and find help when you need it. Um, yeah. And it, it is fulfilling to, you know, you're you're providing a lot of opportunities for people who may not have had access out there so like that's another thing that has to be fulfilling about about what you're doing no i i appreciate that i think that like being in the weeds with it you you really do have to take the time to zoom out to get the ten thousand foot view or else it's really easy to get lost um and there have been moments where i'm like how are we in the red you know working as much as we do and then you just have to recalibrate and think about approach, think about like the entire machine. Um, I really like systems thinking, right? Like as a game designer, like I really like fun challenges to kind of deconstruct things that aren't working. Um, but I but I do find this uniquely challenging. And so it has been finding others to reflect back and asking for help when you need it. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot of posturing and pride uh, in the business world. And I didn't go to business school. A lot of artists that have created businesses do not have business degrees, but like there is this way that if you navigate honestly, um, and then really just fill in the gaps and continue to commit to the learning, um, I feel more capable now than when I started for sure. Yeah. It, you mean you're, you're a seasoned vet now? <laughs> um, but transitioning off that about con continuously learning, um, yeah, a few weeks ago, you shared some news with with our kind of leadership cohort that we have. You got some funding for a project that you're working on. So it'd be, I think it'd be great to, to transition to what you do with like NYU, with Columbia, and perhaps talk a little bit about the project if you can, the project that you're working on, your current project. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when... This, this is kind of like an origin story of how I got involved in the digital storytelling lab. So I worked on a project called Leica's Adventure um, back in 2014. Um, and so Leica's Adventure is the story world of a, a female robot scientist and she's from the planet Ami and her planet has come under um, climate distress and all the other robots are trying to figure out an exit strategy but she decides that she doesn't have enough data to really figure out how this happened so that she can't get to a solution. So she shoots through a wormhole to earth and asks the children around earth how they take care of their communities. And we did this uh, program with UNICEF. Leica is a plush toy, um, but there's a little pocket in her heart belly. I actually, I can get Leica, sorry. <laughs> this is Leica. 
Oh, nice. So um, one of my favorite things about Leica is she's a design with um, really like proof of concept. So um, children around the world help build her, specifically um, boys and girls clubs from Canada to Los Angeles. Um, but her pocket heart is a really beautiful design flaw, some might say, because it was built for a specific iPhone. Um, and mm. the iPhone has changed since. But I love that because I think that really kind of thinking about how technology changes and, and having that challenge in the initial build was really cool as a creative prompt for our, our kids that were working with her. Um, and then they got to prototype solutions around around it. Other ways we used to do workshops where um, we asked how she would communicate in this new space. So they had to build a communication device for her out of recycled materials. Um, and they also had to build like a backpack or something to carry all of her newfound treasures in. Um, so it was, you know, a, a sense of how do we teach empathy in that what I need for me is not necessarily what I what you need for you. Mm -hmm. um, and and really kind of asking informed questions to create space and safe space for people to kind of reveal themselves and um, and grow. And Leica was this new student type of experiment when we brought her into workshops with youth. So the reason I bring that up is um, that was the project that got me involved in the digital storytelling lab because the founder, Lance Weiler, was a collaborator on that project. And so um, as we continued to work together, I became more involved in these experimental um, story projects with the lab at Columbia. And so the lab really explores forms and functions of storytelling. So forms being um, you know, traditional books to virtual reality to AI. Um, so we, we explored different technologies as, as forms of storytelling. And then the functions being um, for climate change, like to really make um, to eradicate homelessness, we've taken on a lot of different story-driven projects um, for impact. And so part of the lab is also measuring the impact. How do you build immersive artistic works that reach people and lead them to action? And so, you know, what is, what is that pipeline? So part of my work at the lab um, is building game challenges. In the year 2020, when everything education shifted, um, our lab was asked by a number of other departments mm -hmm. at Columbia to um, design hybrid curriculum and design fully virtual curriculum. So we were able to partner with Miro um, and mm -hmm. build out story worlds. Um, and my program specifically focused on climate. We looked at deconstructing uh, the Green New Deal as recommendations. And we thought about what we wanted to add to it. And then we built a museum for the futures that was 3D, where it was a collection of students' work um, over three years. So that lives online. Um, but it's projects like that that really excite me. How do you involve more people um, in creative solutions using tech as an intervention? Well, and you're getting them early and you're getting kids where maybe there's no limitations on their ideas. Yeah, no, that's, absolutely. that's amazing work. Yeah, it, you know, it, it really is. It's like, that's one of the reasons people always ask, like, why do you like working with kids? They're like uninhibited. They, you know, you, we, we do an exercise with um, younger kids in workshops often, where it's 100 ideas in five minutes. And when you say that to a room of adults, they're like 100 ideas. Like, what mm -hmm. are these like notes? Like, what am I you know, you have to like kind of give them a little more prompting, but kids are like, got you. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, can I, can I do 101? And it's like, yes. Yeah. Do as as you want. <laughs> it's so interesting that, you know, the, the, as we get a, to be adults, we think experience is a benefit, but in oftentimes experience can, can really create tunnel vision because the things that we've seen, like, so there's an example right at Netflix when I first joined in 2012. They're like, oh yeah, we just can't put video on the platform, like uh, except for the streaming videos, right? Like we do can't do video promotions; they've just failed all the time. Mm -hmm. And if we continue to just listen to that, yeah, they tried it in 2009, they tried it in 2010, and they couldn't get it to work. If we continue to listen to that, you know, we where would Netflix be now, right? And I was like, no, like context has changed, people have changed, expectations have changed, like all the things, like the world has changed. Kind of to your point with like new media, like everything is constantly evolving with 
new platforms, new new just ways of telling stories that like you just have to keep moving and you can't do you can't not do something because it failed four years ago. It's just a yeah. different time, right? So that, that's what I love about getting in the room with kids and the most successful adults, at least in the creative space, are ones that don't lose that wonder, right? That curiosity. Yeah. yeah. Right? I mean, it's 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 the why, right? It's it's really kind of the core of of what brought you into the space. Um, and I also the the connection also between the research and the production side of me is my research is like specifically in play to learn. So this idea of, of really um, this constructionist approach and, and the class that I currently teach um, is called interactive narrative. And so it's how the stories we tell shape our realities. Um, and beyond that, right, you have the sociological approach. We do a lot of readings at the beginning in terms of stories that have impacted worldviews. Um, but then we end the course with the students create story Bibles and they're all in the school of engineering. So it's a lot of hybrid interactive projects, um, which are really interesting and kind of challenging as, as you apply um, different story tropes to new mediums. So I, I love uh, being in groups that, you know, have the ability to give feedback in really nuanced ways and what, what is engaging, what's, what's an environment that's fun to be in. How are we emotionally um, responsible, right? Like that comes up a lot in class as we're building, as it, you know, it's world building. So you kind of think about what space are you bringing people into? Um, are there rules of the space? How do you communicate those rules? And then if you're introducing to them something that's emotionally resonant or perhaps potentially triggering, how do you bring them out of that space safely as well? So we call it like emotional onboarding and offboarding. Um, and it has to happen not only in a headset, right? It also has to happen like um, in an, an exhibit space or, um, you know, especially if you're looking at difficult world problems that um, a lot of people have experienced like hunger and and war. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And that's so cool that you, you actually have named things that, emotional onboarding offboarding like these things that we kind of know in creation of things like you you sometimes you intentionally do it you want that aha or like that punch in the gut and just let them sit with it but in some cases that punch in the gut you don't you don't want them to sit with that because you you need to then bring them down from this emotional high so it's amazing that that that's actually in curriculum and that's being taught in in these classes um and so in NYU, Columbia, how does someone get into these classes? Like, are these electives? Like, does these sound like great programs to be part of? Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, so uh, in Columbia, um, the Digital Storytelling Lab has um, four course offerings. Um, I'm sorry, three course offerings throughout the year. And you can take them in order. You don't have to take them in order. Um, so those are offered in the School of the Arts. Um, and so you can take them graduate school. There's uh, some... It's mainly for the graduate school. Um, mm -hmm. I have taught in the School of Professional Studies. So I had a course called Designing Futures in the School of Professional Studies high school program, which has changed over the years. And so that takes on different forms. So international high school students, um, you know, not only come to the campus for the summer, but that's offered online now as well. Um, so that has really interesting um, arts and critical thinking classes and also, um, you know, other ways to get involved in the university. But my course lives in that department. Um, at NYU, my course lives in the School of Engineering. So in Tandon School of Engineering, there's a program called Integrated Design and Media, which is really a humanities approach to um, computer science and a lot of the engineering um, disciplines. And so um, what we focus on is really interactive storytelling, but understanding not only how are we telling stories that inform and build worlds, but how are we um, thinking about technology as a partner? How are we using AI in creative ways? Um, and then also really thinking about uh, collaboration. I'm uniquely aware as an independent producer um, how valuable these classrooms are for the students if they look at their peers as collaborators. So mm -hmm. 
you know, in Columbia, we've had the opportunity to do group projects that work so beautifully. Um, in NYU this semester, we did an, I did individual story Bibles. Um, but because of um, one of the pieces of feedback that really touched me and made me, you know, it's one of those moments where you're like, okay, I'm, I'm doing something right. Um, or with the, the students um, said that because the space was safe, they were allowed to tell vulnerable stories. And they truly all did tell stories with like a very deeply rooted personal statement um, and understanding of why they were making it, which is really like, I, I mean, these are, these are ready to pitch. I, I would put them in front of any network, to be honest. They were really sophisticated, but they started from a really honest place. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I have no doubt. And when we did feedback, and this is um, something that we use, that I, I got from the lab, um, and it comes from theater, um, non-judgmental feedback. So we ask the students to respond in the form of a question that can be additive, um, that can help their peers take the idea further. Um, so instead of the inclination to respond and be defensive of the idea, they accept, they write it down, they take the feedback, and it just kind of changes the process of, of getting and receiving, you know, and giving feedback. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of adults and professionals can probably benefit from that same exact approach, right? Of it. And then the thing that I'll put into it, and the, I love that the collaboration part is what you emphasize, right? Because in creative especially, and I think in other industries too, but the idea of ego, it gets in the way of a lot of progress and a lot of possibilities of what could be, right? Because we want to be, we seek to be understood as opposed to seeking to understand, right? right. So a lot of times we're like, well, this is what I was thinking. This is what I, what I, what I, 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 I. But if you really listen and hear what people are saying, it might not be something that you would implement right away. But the fact that you're listening to it and you're open to it and you're, you're letting your ego get out of the way and know that this is a truly safe collaborative space, right? I think we would do so much better work. And I love that you talked about creating safe spaces because true storytelling comes from vulnerability, right? Like yeah. honesty and vulnerability. And when if we can get vulnerable and be honest with each other, the world would just be a much better place, period. Whether it's creation, whether it's like just being better humans, um, I think, and all of this, I think we'd be in a better place for sure. And I think all of this you're instilling early on in these future professionals' careers that if they take these lessons with them, they'll go much farther than if they didn't. Yeah, no, I, th that's the hope. And you know, it's so funny because it's, it's really helpful to me. I found that teaching is really, it's a reinforcement. It helps me document the work better. It also helps me test assumptions, you know, especially, um, I also, I didn't mention, but I also teach a high school program. Um, in the Bronx. And so um, that's been creative entrepreneurship and video gaming. Um, so really just kind of the design side. And and those are the spaces that I thrive because I am most creative when I'm learning. Um, it's a tried and true method. I know that I'm also most excited about the work when I'm learning something new and I'm challenged in a new way. And so I hope that that is something that um, you know, I can reflect in the ways that, that I teach as well. Um, yeah. Well, um, this might be a tough question, maybe not a tough question, but for a high school program, you teach it in the Bronx. If someone's not in New York, how is there a way for them to get access to the things that you're teaching? Cause it's like not everyone's going to be going to NYU or Columbia, right. And not everyone lives in the Bronx, it's right. Are there programs that you're playing or that you know of that, college kids, high school kids, even early stage professionals can have access to? That's a great question. And honestly, that's motivating to me. I've, I've been told I should translate some of this into, you know, ac accessible on the web and other ways. Um, and, and I do have, you know, I have all, all these um, curriculum models for different games and um, methods, but no, I, I don't have anything that um, everyone can engage in and, and I should. Um, and I feel like it would be helpful to me to kind of have it in a central place as well. Um, but right now I've, I've been building programs for specific, um, programs. And yeah. so that has kind of been, um, you know, like this decentralized, you know, they're very specific 
programs, but um, yeah. it would be, yeah, it would be helpful to me to kind of zoom out um, and see what the common denominators are and what would be most helpful and, you know, just do like a short segment. Like, I love what you're doing with this program, like pulling out the learnings from different creatives. It's, it's helpful. It's helpful to really understand how other people are challenging themselves and growing. Um, but that has been suggested. So I, I will definitely think yeah. about it. And we'll follow up. It. I have some, I have some thoughts for you that, that we can follow up on after this. Um, but now I kind of want to transition into um, just advice. So knowing what you know now, um, what would what advice would you give either your younger self or somebody now that is thinking about getting into new media, creative spaces, producing, even on the technical side of like creative engineering? Yes, absolutely. So I would definitely, and I have to remind myself this, but I would definitely tell anybody um, coming up in a creative discipline that they're passionate about, especially uh, if they're early to the game. I tend to be early working in new media. Um, sometimes some of the language or the communities that I'm working in are considered fringe, right? And you have to figure out ways to kind of translate your experience. But what I would recommend is, is really just staying committed to your vision and really do work on you know, what does it mean to be a better communicator? But you don't have to retrofit what you're doing to anybody else's model. In fact, it's really important that you don't. And just be passionate and confident and clear about your vision. And I think feedback is really necessary to grow, but you also have to define that center for yourself. Where, where are you really true and, and how much can you sway from that? And you know, as I, I would think about it kind of like a scatter plot, right? Like it's really helpful to experiment and understand your boundaries uh, and the parameters of what you're doing as you, you know, course, um, you, you know, chart a trajectory, but your, um, but your course itself, I think you have to like check in with yourself often um, because the only certainty is uncertainty. The things are going to constantly shift and change. And being agile and resilient has been the most helpful. So you will get knocked down. And a lot of people in my space really believe in failure and encourage failure um, because it's the only way to really understand how you want to course correct and grow. Um, so I find that recently I've been using the word recalibrate a lot, <laughs> which yeah. is just... Um, you know, you have to find different. And for me also as a creative, I really like change. Um, but in the kind of ways that my mom brought up the other day that when I was young, I used to change my room around all the time, like every couple of months. And then in my early 20s to 30s, like I, I traveled a lot. I lived in a lot of different places. I, I moved a lot. I think changing my context, you know, not only from a cognition standpoint, right? Like sensory, different sensory inputs are good for you um, creatively. But for me, I think change is necessary to see new perspective around a problem, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I like to reorient not only where I am, but like my space itself so that, um, and I've started to do that with some of the problems in my business to try to figure out like, okay, I have all the resources that I need. How do I reconfigure what I have? Yeah, absolutely. You said there was a lot of great stuff in there. So somebody wants should probably go back and listen to. You. But I try I was trying to take notes as you were going. And the the things that really stick out to me and I I wanted to reiterate are like the embrace failure, right? Like that is one thing that people we we have this fear of failure, but what does failure really mean? Failure is just the world telling us to try something differently, right? And I don't look at failure as being knocked down. I look at failure as being knocked down and then not getting back up, right? Like because you stopped trying. So yeah you know, we have to embrace that, like, okay, so this didn't work. What's another way the world is trying to tell me to do this, right? And then another thing you talked about is really be comfy about your passion, but also like, and I'm adding a little bit, but who you are, right? And knowing who you are. And that's a big thing. I think there's a lot of professionals out there that if you ask you this, if I ask them this question, who are you? They'll say, I am a senior director at Google, working at the Google Zoo. Like they'll tell you their job and their company they work for but like no who are you right and they will have no idea how to answer that question um and then i love the reorienting 
yourself and like adding perspectives because i think that's what life is about right experiencing yeah. things that that craft and create your perspective right and if you just stick in one place you're not really adding any experience or perspective to your worldview you're just kind of staying the same and that's not what what life is about it's about staying yeah. curious constantly learning evolving learning more about the things that are happening around us because if you don't stay up and stay curious you'll be left behind right and and unfortunately yeah. we see that a lot in today's world too yeah and i think that this like reflection of self too one of the things that has become apparent as i've gotten older and just um working with students and seeing what i don't want them to do you know kind of in retrospect of things i wish i hadn't done is the self-doubt creeps in, in in ways that you can't really anticipate sometimes. So if you've had something um, happen to you that has nothing to do with your work or um, your business, it can still um, convince you that you don't, or, you know, it can still bring you out of touch with your center, right? So mm -hmm. I think that that is something that we all just have to keep in check. Um, and I, I am grateful that my confidence has grown over time um, because I'm really proud of how resilient I am. But it is that reorienting, like, it doesn't mean that I don't still have some of the same problems and challenges that I've been trying to address. But I, I do know that I have a stronger capacity and that I'll grow my capacity as I take on more challenges. Um, yeah. And, and you have a just a greater aware, awareness of like, what we almost what we talked about before is like, you can't know everything. No, right? you, so like you don't you know. <laughs> yeah, and 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 just being aware sometimes of what your your gaps are, because mm -hmm. you can then now you know where you can bring people on to help fill those gaps, or are those gaps necessarily do they need to be addressed at this moment in time? And sometimes they don't, right? right? Um, so like I love that. I love that approach. I love that that way of thinking about things. Um, and I know we're, we're coming at time. Want to ask one more question um, about mentorship? what you can mention someone if you want but what has have you had mentors and has mentorship played a role into getting to getting you where you are today yeah absolutely um i've had so many mentors both um people that have guided me from their experience so so older mentors but also younger mentors at this point i think that that's like building learning communities is definitely intergenerational um, and I and I do feel like I'm I'm always learning from the people around me in really different ways. Um, Rico, you've been a mentor in terms of really guiding me and helping me understand how to um, be true to myself, but also represent my work in a way that's tangible um, to to different communities I haven't worked in, which was a really amazing learning opportunity for me, but really challenging because I think that mentorship is also like maybe there's a built-in assumption of care, um, which is why I find it like kind of antithetical to how a lot of businesses work. Like if you're in a network or if you have a boss, it's not their responsibility to mentor you. And when I was working in corporate spaces, I think that um, talent coming up underneath me had that assumption that they were like entitled to a mentor, that somebody, that was how we all succeeded, that somebody took them under their wing. But that hasn't been my reality. It hasn't been one single person. It's been a lot of people believing in me that encouraged me to believe more in myself. And then when I show that belief in myself, they show, hey, look, I also, I knew you had it in you. Here's the connection point to help you grow. But it is, it is that um, it has to be an exchange too. You know, I think that the work of the mentee, um, right now I'm mentoring a high school student um, who's working on her first documentary. And we first started telling the documentary about her school. But what I realized, so halfway through the project, she said, and she came to me all worried, and she was like, I'd really like to change my topic. And I was like, bet, we are so prepared to do that because you have all of the methods that you need. You, you've already started transcription, like you really understand what it means to thematically code an interview and pull out, you know, pieces of your storyboard, like she already had the techniques down. And we knew exactly where we were at. And so I knew that it, it kind of instilled more confidence in me that she was confident enough to change her topic. Um, and so and it's it's gone really beautifully, because 
I think that it is that exchange, like show me you're capable and you want to do more and I will give you more. Um, and I hope that that is how it's working. And I've seen that that's worked in my world as well. Like when I come to people with an offering um, and often my projects get off the ground with an exchange of services. You don't often just get funding because somebody's like, that girl is smart, <laughs> like, you know? Um, and I've, I've done a lot of those like incubators and, um, you know, I, I did hackathons early on and all sorts of, um, you know, those ecosystems that connect you directly with investors. But I found again, that it really is more about the community and the people that mm -hmm. have invested in you over time will ultimately continue to believe in, in your work and, um, and bring you closer to your goals in that exchange, right? Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. And you're, you're right, you're absolutely right. Like, you do need to have something to offer. The, the thing I tell people about getting mentors, like, don't have intention. Don't like, say, I want to pick your brain or like, hey, I just want to grab coffee, like have some intention, like, I want to learn from you. Like, I think there's things I can learn, especially about x, y, and z. Right. Yeah. And that means you are actually thoughtful about the relationship, you're not just gonna waste their time. Right. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. At the beginning of my career, I remember this because I was recently like forced to clean out my Gmail. And so I had like folders of old. Um, I had at different points in time, but this was really like early career. I would do a lot of research in terms of who was doing things in fields that I thought was interesting. And I would write, you know, very personal letters about interest in your work. And I would always get a response because people are interested in why you're interested in their work. Like it's, you know, it's not just self-indulgent, but it's also like, oh, is this person somebody that I could also help grow in, in what I'm doing? Um, I My summer apprentice was from one of the digital storytelling classes. She's a graduate student at Columbia. Um, and I recently pulled her onto a production as well. So, you know, you're just building an ecosystem of trustworthy collaborators. Um, that also are multi-talented and have different interests and skills. And so I have collaborated with the same people in very different ways, which I also think is just a testament to having a well-rounded um, community. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Okay, um, last thing, because we're at time, is we'll get some links in the show notes, but I'd love for you to share. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, they want to work with you, or they just want to ask you a specific intentional question, not just to pick your brain, what would be the best way for people to get in touch with you? My email is Barry, my first name, at splitendsmedia.com. So Barry at the company's name.com. Mm -hmm. And also we have a website, splitendsmedia.com, uh, where you can kind of find out about what we've done across design and production uh, and storytelling. Cool. Thank you. Well, thanks again, Barry, for, for joining us today. Really appreciate you taking the time, doing some amazing work. Well, let's chat about how you can, we can get more people to, to benefit from you, um, as I think there's, there's so much opportunity for you. So thank you again for joining us. Um, latest episode of Creators, Creator Leadership with Heart, Barry Adelberg, Split Ends Media. We will catch you next time. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Rika. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creative Leadership with Heart. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. If you're ready to make huge, lasting change in your life, then what are you waiting for? What will your life look like if you took action today? What would it look like if you didn't? If you're serious and you're ready, book your free strategy session today and let's make your future a reality.